Thank you, thank you. <laughs> a great pleasure to be here. We are puppeteers, um, and we're going to talk to you about design uh, for a few minutes. We, we don't entirely think of ourselves as puppeteers anymore. We think of ourselves more as engineers of the emotions, or emotional engineers. Um, oh, sometimes yeah. I'm more emotional than you, but... <laughs> Um, and we're going to be talking about um, something that, that has been engineered over a period of more than a decade, a limb, um, a simple limb that slowly changed and actually eventually um, gave birth to Warhorse, the, the production that's on in London at the moment. This was the prototype of the left leg of the hyena in Fastest in Africa from 1994 uh, that William Kentridge directed with us. And the hyena was a minor devil character in the story, uh, but it was a sort of seductive hermaphrodite and needed to be articulate and slinky. Uh, and puppet forelimbs are quite difficult to operate uh, with any degree of flexibility in, in the traditional sense, uh, and a new limb was required. So. This one has one string. Uh, can you see it? That when you pull the string, the paw curls. Now, it seems quite simple. Um, and why are we making so much fuss? Um, this string here that joins those two points is what automatically curls the hoof when you pull one string. So you get two actions with one string which for a puppeteer is very useful information. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of very basic uh, Swiss clockwork, actually. <laughs> uh, and now we'll show you the puppet from 1994 that, was, that inherited the leg. Oh. It looks like a bundle of junk, and we've got the actual one here. Um, See, here's that leg. Okay, let's go. What? Can't see. You can't see it on the big screen. Now it's not there. So just like open your eyes. <laughs> I'll just show you quickly the big gesture. <laughs> Then we've got to move on. Uh, in, in about 2002, we began negotiations with a puppet company in Mali in West Africa. We were doing a, a show about a giraffe that was given as a gift in 1827 by the Pasha of Egypt to the King of France. And we needed a style for the production. And we knew about some puppeteers living in Mali where the great... Um, tradition of puppetry uh, stemmed from. There was yeah. an empire in Mali. Yeah, from 16-something, I've got the date here. Six, 12, well, 12, 1230 to 1600, uh, where there was massive pa patronage of the arts from the great Malian empire. And the tradition that exists there now is still very much part of daily life uh, in, uh, in, in particularly the rural areas of Mali. So these, these puppets uh, are a, a very ancient tradition, nothing to do with any other tradition like Europe or, or China, very African, seemed the appropriate uh, style for us to use for a show that was, came out of Africa and went into Europe. And we, we had a very fruitful 
rapprochement with this group of puppeteers run by Yaya Kulibali. He's the guy in the center of the image holding a curiosity called the seven-toed foot. And there was in the show um, a giraffe necessary, of course, um, a seven-foot, a seven, a, a five-meter high, five meet, five meter high giraffe, um, which Adrian designed. Uh, there is the, the giraffe. That's the giraffe surrounded by three antelopes from Mali. Um, the, the production became a, a huge collaboration and a swap over in a sense. The, the Malians uh, ended up in our giraffe and we ended up in their antelopes for, because of the lo logistics of backstage politics. And um, <laughs> the, those antelope look very free and easy, but they're very heavy to work. <laughs> um, we all got residual back pain since then, but... Uh. Anyway, the, uh, the show... The show uh, toured, and it was seen by Tom Morris. In fact, he, he came to see it in Cape Town. Tom Morris was once the director of the Battersea Arts Centre in London when we performed Faustus with the, um, uh, this puppet. And he wanted to do something with us, and a decade later, he was an associate director at the National Theatre in uh, in London, and he came to Cape Town thinking that maybe he could move the giraffe piece uh, to the National Theatre. Uh, just one thing to note, that the giraffe has four legs. Oh yeah, we have a reason for that. <laughs> um, it didn't work out going to the National, but he did propose another show about two months later to Adrian. Yeah, I got a phone call, and he said there is this story written by a British author called Marco Morpurgo about the First World War, and a horse in the First World War. It's about a, a young boy who grows up on a farm in Devon, but his father sells the horse that he's brought up from being a foal uh, to, the, to the war, the early part of the war. The boy is heartbroken because he, he doesn't really like his dad very much, um, and he likes the horse a lot. And, um, and he, he signs up under age and goes to look for his horse. Meantime, the horse is in Europe and, and the, in Belgium, and the, and, and the story tracks both of their paths through the war. And I am sort of giving it away when I, I tell you that they meet in the end. Um. <laughs> anyway, we kind of like the story. We like the challenge of, of thinking about um, making a functioning, uh, fully life-size horse. And so we said we'd, we'll, we, we would start on a on a process of developing the idea and developing the horse. There were a series of workshops, but we're gonna cut that story a little short. Uh, but first of all, we thought, is it possible for, um, for two people to bear a, another person, namely a rider, on their shoulders where the center of gravity is above their heads? Next picture is, is, is one taken late at night where we're trying it out. Uh, we built a, oh, our first Catherine horse. Catherine and Tace first, yeah. I think. This is me uh, and Catherine. Uh, our next door neighbor, our terrified next door neighbor, um, <laughs> and, and Taste Thunder uh, behind me. Uh, Taste has become a, an instrumental uh, force on the designing of the horse. Unfortunately, he's not here tonight because he's making new heads for the horses. Um, and but out of this came the first model uh, for the horse. It had to be something light. It had to be something uh, strong enough to hold a person. So with an, actually an aluminium uh, spine eventually, but we made a cardboard model to start with, and you'll see that the cardboard model has two people standing inside of it. Um, at first, our horse was to be manipulated only by two people, and the front person manipulated the legs when it was moving around the stage, and then and the, the head was kind of into the chest here in a fisherman's... Um, uh, yeah, sort of breastplate. Have breastplate. you seen a fisherman fishing from their chest, but in it's one of those. Um, <laughs> And when, when the horse stopped, you would unhook it and you could manipulate the, uh, the head. Uh, and, and now you can count the legs. Uh, there should be how many? Eight. Yeah, eight. yeah those, those two people, the dark shapes in the middle are, are people. Um. So, we, we made a horse um, out of cane. Uh, it meant... Uh, uh, soaking the cane, drying the cane, shaping it into shape, and making a structure with the aluminium spine that I mentioned. Yeah, and it, and it took four months for us to try and get it right. We went through a range of materials before we settled on the cane legs. Tace invented a way of 
binding the cane to plywood, which meant that we could eliminate a lot of the plywood and have more cane. So it looks a bit like a drawing of a horse rather than a... But we had an absolute deadline for the departure of the horse by freight, by sea, uh, to London. And on the night of the, uh, before the morning of the departure, we still hadn't quite finished the horse. And we never had a chance to test drive it. We were going to drive it down, uh, walk it down the, down the street uh, in Cork Bay. Um, uh, so we took a picture of the horse. We knew that the National Theatre wanted the horse to be functioning before it left our shores. So we took a picture of the horse with the legs like that, and we took another picture of the horse uh. with the legs like that, and we sent them a kind of a video of uh, an animation of the horse uh, running. <laughs> so they were thrilled and excited. We were terrified that when we opened the box, we wouldn't have anything that really properly worked. Um, but, and when we opened the box, what we had was this rather white um, uh, skeleton-looking horse without a skin on it uh, in a white uh, um, uh, workshop environment. And it kind of didn't look right, but it certainly seemed to move right. And this is a little short uh, clip from the very first prototype horse. We realized very soon that we would need three manipulators. Uh, the, the front guy needed to work the head as well as the front legs, and so we added a third person. It's really bad for, for theater economics to have three people working one character. Um, <laughs> but the numbers of the cast just swelled at that moment. <laughs> and Adrian made a very, we went back to Cape Town after the workshop, um, and he made a very detailed drawing of the horse uh, the, as it was going to be finally. Because the show is doing so nicely, we're busy making horses for Broadway. Uh, uh, this is not a finished uh, <laughs> version. This is as far as it happens to be at the moment. We have a little factory in Capricorn Park uh, where um, a whole lot of people who are backstage, two of whom just walked on, are uh, very um, avidly making these horses, um, rap doing all the, the bending and the binding. There's a huge amount of handwork in one of these things. Um, it, we sort of use up to the minute 17th century technology. <laughs> uh, plus, plus a few bicycle brake cables. Um, so built, built into the head control, which is not Hello, quite... This. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Normally this is uh, carried by the front manipulator and he can work it from both sides. So. It's quite important for him to kind of disappear himself as the horse turns around. So a lot of his time he's running around the horse so that he's on the upstage side of the horse. And then she. Basil talked about emotions. Well, the ears are very important. And so... <laughs> so the external... Manipulator works there, and we'll get inside showing you the position of the other two. We would both be wearing backpacks, and we would be strapped to this part of the horse here. Um, this, is, this is the evolution of that little limb you saw in the beginning. Same tendons here that were on that uh, initial model, uh, but with sort of the double joints added. Uh, the back leg also has one this side. If you oh, sorry. <laughs> and then these two bicycle brake cables actually uh, work the tail. <laughs> you can get out now. We're finished, guys. Thank you. Uh, 
uh, once, once the, cane and the cane work is finished, the, the horses are covered in a kind of a stretch georgette, which somehow manages to fit the curves very well. And we wanted to show the, the cane lines of the, of the horse. We didn't want to hide them like we had done in the, in the giraffe. So we, it's much more harder, but we put the, 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 the skin on the inside of the cane and, and fixed it there. When it's lit from behind, it appears quite ghostly and ethereal. And when lit from the front, it's much more three-dimensional. Um, and they're really important, that the, the Georgette, in giving three dimensions to the... What's not so important, but that picture's on the cover of our book. <laughs> <laughs> so... The story has a foal in it in the beginning. And uh, uh, there is a, a tricky transition in the play. It's difficult always in a play for a character to grow up, for a child to become an adult, uh, for a horse to be, for a foal to become a horse. So um, the choreographer, uh, Toby Sedgwick, devised a really beautiful scene where the foal has to split into pieces and the, the big horse uh, comes galloping in from upstage. Now we do so, have, sorry. Yeah, so what, what's happening here, what you see there, um, is four, four legs uh, which are not attached in any way to the body, which is just placed on top of those four legs, and then a head which is placed on top of the body. So nothing is actually connected, but they, do, they are able to ru run around as if everything is connected. Uh, but as the big horse comes in, the whole thing kind of explodes. We'll show you later. Um, here, here is an image of more than two horses. Um, uh, and this is seen from the side, which the audience wouldn't usually see. Uh, what, you, what you really look at is from the end, and you see a row of horses ready for a cavalry charge. So it's um, a kind of a, a visual synecdoche, a part for the whole, because we can't have uh, three puppeteers plus a person riding on a horse on ten horses. So we decided to have two, uh, two horses that would be fully articulated, that is, with three puppeteers and with uh, a human being riding on the back, and that's the first two that you see there. And then behind them, there are horses with no legs, just puppeteers' legs, and puppet bodies. Uh, so um, one, one puppeteer moving the puppet body and one puppeteer moving the horse, two all together. Uh, this, the, the two main horse characters meet each other and have to fight it out to find out who's the alpha horse, like lots of boys do. And um, um, this is an image just to show you that the front manipulator, we call them the heart, has to be able to unstrap his backpack, lift the front legs, and then push the whole horse up into the air to get that rear up. Physically incredibly demanding. Now we're going to show you that little section of Joey the foal growing up. And I'd like you to watch for a couple of things. Um, the visible manipulators, which uh, are pretty clear. Um, but just watch as the horse is going around. Watch for the, uh, the foal is going around. Watch for the big horse in the background as he is prepares to make his entrance. That is, that is um, Craig Leo, who is uh, one of the puppeteers that you'll see later on. And of course, watch for, for Joey's explosion and the actor jumping onto the back of the grown-up horse at the end of, the, of this little segment. It's this a minute is a, long. It's a rehearsal shot. There, there exists no footage of the actual play because of huge union issues. So this is as good as it gets in terms of movies. <laughs> Sorry about the quality. <laughs>
so now we're going to show you um, a last uh, video. It's twice as long and a half, two and a half minutes long. It's Joey's Night. Um, it's the section of the play, the kind of worst section of the play for the horse. He's lost. He's in the middle of a battle. Um, he doesn't know where he is, and uh, it's the middle of the night. And he ends up in no man's land full of barbed wire. So it's, 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 a, it's a terribly traumatic scene. One, um, one of the things that's special about the scene is that at one stage you'll see there's seven people manipulating one horse. Um, one of the phenomena of the production was how, um, how people had to work together in, in order to, to kind of make a life. And the level of cooperation was quite extraordinary. Well, since Warhorse, we've had many approaches to do quite odd things sometimes. Um, but uh, we had one invitation from Franco Dragoni, who is one of the people who's, who is responsible for Cirque du Soleil. He was opening, he is opening still, uh, a new circus in China, in Macau, called City of Dreams, and the show will be called that. And he wanted a giraffe. So we said we could provide him with a giraffe. Um, and in fact, the giraffe has been ready for a week or so, um, and we persuaded him that we, we needed to keep it for you guys to show you before sending it off. And so... <laughs> he very kindly agreed. So Craig, who was the front end of the horse, and Charles, who is new to us, but is also an equally good stilt walker, uh, are waiting to show you the giraffe. You can dim the lights and some music, please. The Savannah on a quiet evening. 